Steve Gargiulo works with people from all walks of life, from all over the world, to help them make their ideas happen. His new book, Surge, Your Guide to Put Any Idea into Action, provides the blueprint for how to take more action on ideas, sharing dozens of stories, and distilling proven instructional design, social science, and adult learning theories. He loves, among many things, Honest Tea, the movie Mrs. Doubtfire, and uh, the Ghostbusters theme song, which is, uh, you know, that's interesting. So let's uh, give a warm Google welcome to Steve. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. Cool. Thank you all for taking time out of the day to be part of this conversation today. I'm going to talk for maybe like 10 to 12 minutes, and then we can have a conversation from there, because I think that's more interesting. So uh, I want to start with something that I love, uh, and I love Post-it notes. So maybe a lot of you spend a lot of time using post-it notes. I feel like I spend a lot of time using post-it notes. Um, but they have a lot of interesting uses that maybe you're not used to seeing. So you can use them to decorate an office. You can use them as sunscreen. You can use them for a really kick in winter is coming Game of Thrones party. Uh, you could teach someone a lesson who parked in a space that maybe you shouldn't have parked in. And it turns out that apparently you can even use them as cheese uh, if you're really in a bind. So uh, as someone who loves post-it notes, uh, a few years ago when I was at uh, South by Southwest, I was walking around one of the exhibition areas, and 3M was there. And they had those really big post-it notes that they had debuted, these ones that are like bigger than the size of a human head. And I had never seen those before. And they were giving them away for free. So I was like, I want to get a lot of these. and like. Like a lot, so like I walked up and I kind of took like a bunch of stacks, and I'm walking with my friend to a bar, and we're figuring out like, okay, what are we going to do with all these big post-it notes that we just acquired? So we decided to just write on one of these post-it notes, "Free Problem Solving Hashtag Zero Problems," and we're sitting at a bar that's like looking outside into the street. We just put this sign up, and we start accosting people as they walk down the street. So we have our little kind of like free problem solving stand, and we're like, hey, whatever your problem is, you know, horseback riding, welding, business, you know, you name your problem, we'll solve it for you. And at first, there's like a couple people like, does my shirt fit well? And we're like, well, well you could do this. Or like someone's like, can I get a light bulb for this? I'm like, we found a light bulb. But then all of a sudden, this big line started forming. And this girl, uh, there's this girl who's like, can I solve problems with you? And it's like, sure. So then she's solving problems with us. We had an intern who was like getting people a couple blocks down. All of a sudden, the big South by accounts, like this shit I saw at South by Southwest is like a big account. And so it turns into this whole thing of all these people um, who are coming getting their problems solved. This woman who turns out she's like an executive at Goodwill, she's like, how can we grow our brand? It's like, you have like 500 stores. How could you not grow your brand? At one store, triple your prices. At one store, offer gift wrapping. At one store, have a co-working space. She's like writing down all these things. She's like, can you come and like give us more ideas? It's like, I just gave you 10 ideas. Go do those, and then maybe we can talk. But one of the crazy things that I learned from this experience, and there was a lot of crazy things. Like we actually left, the thing kept going. Like it turned into a whole kind of big thing. But one of the things I learned from that experience is that people seem to value collecting good ideas more than they do actually making any of them happen. Right? And we're all guilty of this from time to time. We have those ideas that we're collecting. We're collecting those really good ideas in the back of our heads. But sometimes it can be really hard to make them happen. And so I think one of the things that made something like this happen was the fact that we're just like, Hey, we got some post-it notes. Like, let's just try something. And we had that bias towards action to like, yeah, as opposed to the first thing being, let's talk about what we could do, or let's brainstorm, or let's use the post-it notes to come up with ideas for things we could do. It's like we just started doing something with that bias towards action where the first step can be action, and then you think about from there kind of what comes next. You know, I I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, in rooms like this with like a ton of post-it notes. Who's been in rooms like this before, right? But who's been in a room like this, and then a week later you wonder, what the hell ever happened to any of those things? Like, we, like look how many post-it notes. Like, what happened to any of those post-it notes? What happened to any of those things? Um, and so it's, it's a real problem um, in that uh, us not having that bias towards action. But it's something that we can do something about. So, this idea of a surge and what we define uh, in the book is, I, I you know, like like Jake said, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time in is, is in the TED community, and so as a TED organizer and speaker, 
one of the things that happens is you become this idea magnet and all these people come into you talking to you about their ideas, which is great. Uh, but over time, I realized like so few people, like in these examples, so few people were taking action on them. And so I started to study like the science of action. So working with psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, drill sergeants, like what are those important things? And one of those most important things is taking that surge of action right away. Because most of the time what happens when you have an idea is this top bar, right? You have this new idea and then maybe slowly over time, you slowly start to make a little bit of progress. But the most important thing, if you really want to see an idea happen, is take a surge of action right away. And like the first step should be action and doing something. And that's how you start to create the momentum and get on a roll to actually make something happen, to actually bring an idea into reality. I want to tell a couple stories from the book. So the book is filled mostly with what I think are fairly funny stories, because they're very relatable. Because they're the kind of things that make you go, I should have done that. Or like, I could do that uh, with 8 million different things. Okay, so. One starts with these pink flamingo pool rafts. Who's ever been on one of these, or one starts with these, excuse me, white dove pool rafts. Who's ever been in a pool party with one of these? Like, they're pretty cool. So a few years ago, there's a guy who's at a pool party with these white dove pool rafts. And he's like, wouldn't it be cool if there's a pink flamingo version of these? So he Googles it. And at the time, there wasn't one. Um, and most people would just kind of leave it there. But he decides, you know what? Let me just Google China manufacturer. He finds a phone, or you got to on the phone, he's like, Hey, China, like, I want a pink flamingo raft. I want it to look like this, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Eight weeks later, it shows up at his house. He has a pool party with his pink flamingo pool raft. Everybody loves it. He starts giantflamingo.com. This guy has made over six figures selling these pink flamingo pool rafts because in that moment, he didn't just say, this would be a cool thing to do someday. It was like, what is that first step I can take? Yeah, I can find a phone number and call a guy and have one show up and see what happens. And then things start to snowball from there. OK, another story. So when the App Store started to get big, 2008, 2009, everybody's making apps. Everybody wants to make an app. Have to have an app. What's your app? Got to have an app. And there's a guy who's like, all right, I want to have an app. Everybody has an app. I have no ideas for any apps. But what I can do is I can look in the App Store and say, what is the most downloaded, lowest rated app? So what is the one that people want the most, but it sucks? Well, it turns out it was like the Spanish Bible. Like the only Spanish Bible app crashed all the time. It was really bad, like, but people want a Spanish Bible. So he's like, well, the Bible is like free. Like the Bible content's just out there. And he's like, I can hire someone to make a Spanish Bible app. He makes a new Spanish Bible app, makes a ton of money on this Spanish Bible app just because he put it out there because he had that idea. I'll give you one other example. There's a, a woman when FBA came out, fulfillment by Amazon, great, where you can just basically send them stuff. It counts as their listing. They fulfill the orders, all that. Um, so when that started to get big, maybe two years back, there was a woman who was like, uh, I want to use this service. I got to figure out what I can do. I know I can make some money on this. She decided, if I go to Target every week, the Target in my hometown, they have a clearance rack that's filled with all brand new products, like a vacuum cleaner, a spatula, all this stuff. It's new. It's not used. It's got the label. It's perfectly good. She buy everything on the clearance rack, put it in a box, sent it to Amazon. Amazon lists it, fulfill the orders, all this stuff. She makes six figures a year buying stuff on the clearance rack, driving to FedEx, putting it in a box, sending it to Amazon, and spending the rest of her life just hanging out. Okay, But because she had that bias towards action to do it, and there's millions of these kinds of stories, and they're not all about money, right? Like they can be things like activism. There's this woman in Tunisia who wanted to preserve the Star Wars set, the original Star Wars set from the original Star Wars movie, and as opposed to just thinking about it, like started this campaign, it turned into this whole thing. Like, but there's a lot that we can learn from those stories to think like, oh, of course I see myself in this, and there's the idea that I have in the back of my head right now, I can work to make that happen. So a couple of the lessons that I think are important, just to kind of wrap this up, is that one is that action is a muscle. So just like some people exercise their biceps, not me, but some people. Like you can exercise your action muscle. And it's a matter of like working to say like, okay, anytime I have an idea, what is action that I can take right away? And you start to work that muscle and then you can start to develop that action bias. Another is we have to break the tendency that is we want to set aside time later. Like we'll often say we build ideas up to be so big in our head. We have this great idea to say, I need to set aside a day where I can bang that out. Like I'm going to block my calendar for Friday where I'm going to do that. 
but you don't respect that time, you don't protect that time. You respect someone's meeting that they put on your calendar that you don't even like that person, but you prepped for their meeting instead of your thing because you were forced to in that, but you can't force yourself to do it. Like You can't set aside the time later. You don't respect it. Later never comes, right? You have to work on doing that sooner. And then one of the biggest things is when I have an idea, it's often really hard to come up with actions for my own idea. But when someone else has an idea, it's super easy to give that person, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. It's easier to fire off actions for other people. So the collaborative nature is actually super important for ideas. And one of the things that happen when we have an idea, it's not fully formed yet, we're a little bit embarrassed to share it with other people or to talk to other people about it because we feel like it's not baked yet. But the most important thing you can do is to have a conversation with other people about it because they can help you think about what the actions are that you could take right away to be able to do something. Like we all get caught up in this game. I was on a phone call last week with a colleague who was like, we got to design a survey to send out after this program. He's like, what questions do you think should be on it? And they're talking for 20 minutes about what questions. I'm like, guys, I just sent out the survey. Like I uh, logged into SurveyMonkey. I built it while we are talking. Like we don't need to over-engineer this. Like, that bias towards action is something that you just need to constantly check yourself on, and it's, it's really important. And then the last thing is that everything in life that's hard is just a series of things that are easy. So it just needs to be broken down. Right When we have these ideas that are big, I could have write a business plan for company X on my calendar for six months, and oh, I don't want, oh, it's hard. I don't know when I'm going to do that. That's really hard. How do I get started? But if it's just a matter of breaking it down to like, Google business plan, read the first 10 articles, pick a template, fill out the first section of the template, which is what you would actually do anyway. It's like, oh crap, like I could have done that. But when you build it up in your head, that's you know, when you get into trouble. So everything in life that's hard is just a series of things that are easy. This is us, that's me. Happy to answer questions and have a conversation about action. So like what? Or do you want to no, start sure. there? Uh, tear it up for Steve. Cool. Thanks. We're both super tall guys, so we're going to just get a little bit more intimate here. Cool. And we hope you've all brought your live questions and your ideas. Steve uh, is excited to hear them. I figured we could start off with a softball question. All right. Uh, Steve is a huge traveler. He's been to over 100 countries. I you know? thought we were going to talk about softball. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I haven't asked but, yet. Um, what, uh, what, what, uh, what is your most underrated travel tip, and what is your most overrated travel tip? Hmm. So I think probably underrated actually is uh, hotels, and not staying in hotels. I mean, sometimes hotels, sometimes Airbnbs, but like, you can use hotels that you're not staying that you're not staying in for so many things. Like a hotel is your you need an envelope, like. Walk to a hotel, find an envelope. Like any double tree hotel in the world, you walk in, you can have a cookie. Like you want you wanna go swimming, like walk into a hotel and like go swimming. Like you wanna find a bathroom, you need to print your boarding pass when you're staying in an Airbnb, walk into a hotel and say, like, can I print my boarding pass? Like I think you can use hotels as your personal service, like very easily when traveling. So cool. OK, I have a bunch of questions here, but uh, does anyone have any live questions for Steve about ideas they're thinking about? or, And, and you'll have time to, oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so this isn't an idea that I have, but uh, just the whole idea of what you said earlier about like um, a surge in action, and that's sort of how you move things forward. Um, what about just like sustaining that motivation, sustaining things even past that surge? Yeah. Any, any recommendations there? So accountability is super important, right? Because we all have things we want to do, and it's like, how do you hold yourself accountable? Everybody has different things that work right for them, and so knowing yourself is also really important. One of the reasons oftentimes you're more accountable to someone else's meeting than your own is because you have that like guilt feeling of like there's somebody else involved. So I think getting other people involved really helps. So like having an accountability buddy, like I, I have different friends who I do something I call accountability days with, where we'll block out two days together. And we'll say, great, the first day, we're going to be 100% focused on your stuff. But I'm going to be at your service. So like, you want to help make a website? You want to help do this? Like, I'm going to be working for you. The second day, we're 100% focused on my stuff. And you're going to be helping me out. And I find that over the course of those two days, I'll get way more done. Even though I'm only spending one day on me, I get way more done than if I spend two days by myself trying to work. 
Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can use people to hold yourself accountable with accountability check-ins and tools and things like that. So I think the biggest thing is knowing what is it for me that's the hang-up, and then how do you combat that? You know, in some um, languages, there's actually two words for what we would think of as procrastination. So there's the classic definition of procrastination, which is I know what I need to do, but I'm not doing it. And then there's this definition of procrastination, which is I actually don't really know what I need to do yet. Like I'm letting it be on the slow burn. I'm letting it simmer in my subconscious while I do other stuff so I can come back to it and kind of work on it later. We're really good at tricking ourselves into thinking it's the latter, that like I don't know what I need to do yet, I'm letting it simmer, when the reality is more often than not it's, it's the former. And you actually know exactly what you need to do, it's just a matter of doing it. So. Cool, I think one in the back and then we'll, we'll get you. Okay, so that's very interesting, the idea of pairing up with somebody else to take turns what the other person's um, doing what the other person's doing. So it sounds like it would be very good um, for people with complementary strengths. So what are some examples of what you've been able to contribute to that specifically versus what the other person's been able to contribute? Yeah, a lot of times it's, it's not even necessarily based on complementary strengths uh, because yeah, I could see for example like, okay, I wanna get a website done, like yeah, I'm partnering with somebody who like knows what she's doing and helping me make the website. But oftentimes it can be for as simple things, which is like, no, I just need to sit down and finish writing this copy. Like, I need to sit down and actually like write down what are some jobs that I want to apply to. I need to sit down and write down. Like, uh, honestly, I think it's better for things that you could do yourself, but having somebody else in the room helping you makes it better and makes sure that you actually do it. So it can be the simplest thing on your to-do list, uh, but you're bringing someone else in to help make it happen. Hi. Was there a specific moment where you realized, hey, I should stop procrastinate and should start taking action? And if so, what was that moment? So everyone in the world is their own biggest hypocrite and everything too, right? So I, 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 would, I would be lying to say if I'm not procrastinating on things you know, right now as well. So I don't think there's any given moment where every person could cross a threshold and they never procrastinate again. I think it's a matter of being aware of it and being intentional about understanding that like, okay, like, I am procrastinating right now and there like I know that what I could be doing or should be doing and I'm not doing it. Like where we trick ourselves is the I don't know what I should be doing right now. If you take what I do is in any given situation of something that seems hard, it's like I, I take the five seconds to think about Elon Musk talks a lot about first principles or these kinds of things, right? So you take the five minutes to think about like, okay, why is this seeming hard? What is the thing that I could do right now to either I either need to collect data on this to validate it? I either need to take a first step that kicks it to somebody else to take another step on. I either need to like just get over the fact that my rough draft is going to be horrible so that I can then like give feedback to myself. Whatever it is, it's like what is that first thing that can start the ball rolling? Because it's, oh, it's the first thing that trips us up. We think the first thing needs to be something else. And if you ask yourself like what is something I could do to progress this, that's the biggest thing that starts to get you on the roll. I have a question about <clears throat> something like, um, what, what if you're in a situation like I wanted to uh, get like an investment property, you know, for for a, a while, and I've been kind of on the fence with it. But there's certainly a lot of downside risk, so it's sort of the kind of thing that you don't just want to like take immediate action on and then find yeah. yourself in the world or hurt. What would you suggest for how to go about something that's a bigger thing that might have like a lot of downside uh, risk? Right. So I think the first action then is that's a perfect example of thinking about what are the things that I could start to do first. So for example, if I wanted to start taking action on that, could one of the first things I do be posting on Facebook like, hey, do any of my friends have investment properties? Like, could I chat with you? Or like going and actually like Googling some articles and starting to read about it and see if that like sets me down a path. Or something that's not just doing nothing, which is what it, which was what's super easy, which is I want to do that someday. But like, or looking at like, okay, I'm gonna take three examples of properties to a friend who like, knows about investments and just say like, which of these three would be better? Or like, are all of these horrible? Or like, is that, like actually doing something that starts something. Yeah. I'm sorry that for the vague language, but you know. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation and insights. Uh, what will be your personal uh, tips for the personal management tools, like any apps or something like which you, you, which you find really useful? 
Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and I think it's it's one of those things where it's it's what works for you because we're all different. Jake and I were actually talking about um, tools that can automate tasks for you. Um, so like I love I use Zapier a lot, which is a tool that zaps data between different tools. Jake was telling me about there's a software for Mac called Keyboard Maestro, and it will essentially automate like clicking, button clicking, and downloading things. And like, so if you have any questions, you can shoot me a question. Like often when people think about productivity tools, they're thinking about calendar tools and to-do lists and that kind of stuff, which I find funny because it's like, that to me is not productivity. <laughs> like productivity is not necessarily making a to-do list, though it could be. Productivity is like, what are the things that are making me more efficient and like making me quicker so that at any given moment, it's like boom, 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 things are happening. So I like those kinds of things, or I like, getting people involved in things so I know we're going to make something happen so that I can just remove it from my head altogether. I don't have to put it on a to-do list and think about it later. I can just move it away. Um, thank you for being here. I feel like we can all relate to like the million tabs being, you know, browser tabs being open and having a lot on our minds. And you just spoke to, about productivity. How do you, I just wanted to kind of hear a bit more, like how do you laser in on that focus? Because I do think a lot of us in the room are here because we have a lot of ideas, uh, maybe an overwhelming number of ideas, but how do you kind of shift through, sift through the bad from the good and kind of get that focus? Because I love the idea of like throwing the to-do list out the window. Like if you're not doing it now, like maybe you should never do it. How do you kind of, do you have like a mantra, a framework, or anything else you can expand on to help kind of close all the browser tabs and just be more focused? Yeah, and they eat up a lot of resources. And so um, I think the biggest thing in this situation is like the like, oh, I have so many ideas, like I can't, like I don't know what to do. It's like pick one, do a little bit on that, and now you have our, and uh, like, I know it's facetious, but it's like pick one. If, if truly every single one of them would be great, and there's no way to dis you know, distinguish between them. And it's like, oh, there's so many. I don't know how to pick. Pick one randomly. Write them. Put them in a hat. Whatever. Pick one. Spend some time working on it. And then see, like, oh, this is great. I'm going to keep working on this. Or no, I'm going to do something else. Like, I, I don't buy the idea of, like, I have so many things. And I can't. That if, if one, automatically we have ways that we rank things in our head. You know the one that you're thinking about before you go to bed, the one you're thinking about when you wake up. The, so like automatically something's going to be bubbling up for you. But if something doesn't, then just pick one and start working on it. And, start, and the, the, the other good point of this is like, it, start working on it doesn't mean I'm going to put my life savings into it. Start working on it doesn't mean every night now is working on this. But it's what are those actions that you could start to take that can get you more data, that can get you more feedback, that can get you to a place where you know I want to start investing more time. Uh, and the beauty about doing that is you could actually do that for a number of the different ideas when you start thinking about it from the perspective of what are those quick things that I could do. Maybe it's as simple as register a domain name and put up a launch rock page and see if there's interest. And like that's super simple to do. Um, I, I have something I talk about I call the idea tax, which is that anytime I have an idea, I register a domain <laughs> name. And then I know a year from now, I'm going to get reminded that like I got to pay another 15 bucks in idea tax for this idea that I haven't done anything with. And it's going to trigger me to say, like, all right, are you really going to make garlicbreadreviews.com happen this year? <laughs> or like, can you let that one go? Um, and so what, again, it's, it's kind of whatever it is for you. But it needs to be, what are the little things I can start to do that can set me down the path? That's great. I love the idea of investing time, not financials, in the beginning, because it is. Investing your time is priceless, really. So thank you. Hey, thanks for your time. Um, forgot my question. No, I'll come back. Um, so I like what you said about things being hard sometimes. Um, as we get older, we can say things are hard if they're difficult, but we also have the experience of simpler things to compare them to. Um, I have a young kid, and he doesn't say things are hard. He just says, I can't do this. So do you have um, an example of something you could tell a young kid? Um, I usually would say it's not hard, it's new, because you have not seen this yet. So maybe you have a similar example of what you can tell the younger generation as to um, how to um, take their ideas, um, having a bias to action for things that aren't necessarily hard, but they just need. Yeah. One of the best principles, top principles in coaching is just asking questions. 
And oftentimes when you ask people questions, you realize that they kind of trap themselves in their own logic. And I think that actually works really well for kids is like if, if a kid said to me like that's not possible, I was like, what what makes it not possible? Or like what it like help me and like try to get them talking and extract them out of it and then they find themselves because it's hard I get wanting to say like, no, anything's possible and whatever, but like you telling that to someone doesn't mean they're going to do anything with it. But if you can lead them to that place, uh, then I think that's great. And then I think also, uh, you know, exposing them to all these different things that are possible. So they start to collect those different, you know, life is just this relentless pursuit of insight. And so the more insights from different places that you're getting planted in your brain, the more possibilities that you can see, the more synapses are firing together. So. Hi, uh, so I have a lot of ideas in my head, and when I like start working on them, I don't have a problem starting, but completing them is really hard for me. And I think what happens during the process is that I kind of sabotage myself, thinking like, will it really be successful? Do I have the right network to get, get to market with the idea? Maybe I just do it and no, no one ever sees it, things like that. So all these like doubts start cropping in, especially when the things become like, larger and larger. So like, how do you, like separate the bias towards action from like the outcome, or like how do you see those two things? Are are, are those separate? Yeah, or? that's a really good question. I think part of the seeds of your question that I probably didn't quite answer that I think is really good is like, okay, then if I go and I do start all these different things, that, that can become super overwhelming. Where now I'm taking action on all this and like, okay, what's going on? So a couple things there. I think one is at some point. So I do think the first step on an idea is action. At some point, you have to make a decision on, is this action yielding the results that I would want to see for this idea where it should continue? Or should I pause that, put it away? Let the, like, I think we don't do a good job confirming to ourselves that we're done working on an idea. Our actions say that we're done working on an idea, but we let ourselves beat ourselves up to say, oh, I should still be working on that, versus like, Taking stock and saying like, should I still be working on this, or am I allowed to get, am I allowed to put that one away? There's a great book called Essentialism, uh, which talks a lot about that kind of stuff. Um, one of the exercises in that book, which I, I like doing personally uh, from time to time, maybe every six months, is on post-its or little slips of paper, like, what's everything that I'm actively spending time and energy on in my life right now? And that could be projects, that could be things related to family, that could be like, what are things that I'm actively spending time on? And you have a ton of different things in front of you. And then it's like, which of these are essential? And which are the ones that I want to be spending time? And which are the ones that like, it's time to put away? And like, sometimes we don't like, officially put an idea to bed. And so every now and then that, that, like, you know, that you think about it again, you go, oh, man, I haven't done anything on that. And you beat yourself up on it. When in reality, you can be like, I feel good about putting that one to bed for now. And I'm going to focus on these things. So I think that's an important way to deal with it. And then it doesn't feel so overwhelming. Right. I guess the threshold that I struggle with is like maybe I'm deceiving myself into thinking that you know this idea won't go anywhere just because you know I guess there is the execution part and then there is the hustling part like you know just making the world aware that this thing exists and maybe somebody should use it but maybe I'm too lazy or like you know inept in doing that and then I think my idea isn't great and I just you know put that to rest because it's not going anywhere so that like fork in the road is like really confusing for me and. And one of the best ways to, to maybe think about those is like, how can I start involving some more perspectives in what's currently a very hard thing for me to figure out this fork? Like, I, I don't know if with the ideas you're involved with other people, but, or even if you take it to someone who's not going to be involved with it, where you just want to like bounce, you know, hey, here's what's happening. Like, what do you think? Like, the longer things live in our head, the longer nothing's going to happen with it. But as soon as we can vocalize and talk to somebody about it, even a person who like can't talk, can't emote, can't do anything, like like that blue thing in the back of the room, just saying something to that actually can help you think about like, oh, saying it out loud, I changed this. But then assuming that that thing is sentient and can respond to you, it can give you even more feedback. So sometimes it's a matter of get it out of your head, write it down, say it to someone, and then you can realize, okay, here's how I can pick up the pieces and move it forward. Cool. Thank you. Do you, have any, do you have any like marketing tips for your ideas? Like you mentioned, like you have an idea, create the landing page and put it 
out there to see if there's any interest. Well, let's face it, nobody's going to just show up on your website unless you just uh, find some people, you know, to let them know about it. Do you have any like kind of go-to testing, marketing things that you do to support your ideas? Yeah, question and marketing tips and kind of go-to marketing things. I mean, obviously, using Google services and products, I'm sure would help you know everyone. Um, I, I think it totally depends on the idea, right? Because uh, if you're trying to do something and you're trying to create some kind of campaign or get a bunch of hits on a video, it's very different than trying to sell a product or different than trying to put in, like. So I don't exactly know how to answer that. For me, like when. It's like a retail product. Okay, so for like a retail product. It's a meat sell on Amazon or something like that. Yeah, so I think. I always, I'm a, always a big believer in like the personal aspects of anything. So for me, it would be involving like my closest friends, like in the in the story of it, and getting them jazzed about it, and having them going out on my behalf, like talking about it, and kind of starting there. And that gets to a little bit of enough of a critical mass where you could start to get feedback and figure out like, is this something that's catching on? The other like marketing 101 thing, right? Too is just targeting enough. Like I think. Even though that's so obvious, most people still feel like the products that they make are for everyone, but they're not. <laughs> the products they're making are for a specific person, and they don't take the time to really define that specific person and go work on where are the communities where those specific people exist. Am I a member of that community? How am I contributing and adding value in that community? Have I garnered respect in that community where I can even sell something to that person? Because selling to that person is step 10 on that journey. And if I think I'm just going to put something up and they're going to want it, I haven't built the trust. I don't have the permission. All that kind of stuff. I'm a big believer in Seth Godin and tribes and communities and this kind of stuff. I think community building is like the most important skill set in the 21st century. And so I, that that's kind of how I think about this stuff. Cool. Any other uh, questions for Steve? I got a couple. Uh, let's see. So um, you talk in your book about Divergent thinking, which is, um, let's see, exploration of possibilities, and then convergent thinking, which is like deciding what to do. Um, we talk a lot about unconscious bias and decision making at Google, um, but we don't necessarily think about bias. And, and you've speak to, spoke to it some, like how we use uh, bias towards examining possibilities. Like what's possible for me as an individual? What's possible for my team? Um, and and you've, see, you've been exposed to a lot of cultures and a lot of different company cultures. Uh, curious to get your thoughts about what are some biases people have towards kind of examining possibilities? Yeah. Um, I mean, in general, one of the things that we love doing in companies is having committees and having meetings where we explore possibilities, right? And all of those are still hypotheticals. And so the more we live in hypotheticals where we're exploring and examining what could be, the less that we're spending time in the, like, what actually is. So it goes back to the point of like, as opposed to living in the hypothetical, if there's five ideas to a given solution, what are some things that you could take action on um, that could start to validate them in the real world, whether that's through um, a survey or a prototype or kind of whatever it is that's making it real. Um, now we're having a legitimate conversation versus a, an unknown. Like, I think, especially at Google, I would imagine every decision like, should, is a very data-driven decision. And so like, the longer something's hypothetical, the less data you could possibly have t towards helping you make that decision. So making it real, I think, is the most important thing to do. The other thing I would say that if you think about the cultural aspect is as, you know, uh, I'm sure all of us work on global teams on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like a lot of what we've talked about today, to many people, is viewed as a very like American thing. Like a very, it, it's very American to be action biased and to be and to be doing these kinds of things. Um, and while I don't agree with that, uh, the reality is while there is that perception, then you're going to be looked upon as the person on the team who needs to help drive that change. Like if you're leading a global team and you want to create more of a bias towards action, you need to go two inches more for every inch you want to see the rest of your team go. Um, and so the role modeling I think is really important if, if you're thinking about wanting to create more action bias in your teams, then you have to be doing it too. Cool. Any other live questions for Steve? 
All right, great. Well, thank, thank you all so much. Thank you, Steve, for being here. Let's uh, hear it Thanks one more time for Steve. Thanks.